What is going on YouTube? Lamont at large. Today I'm in the Riverside Cemetery here in South Kingstown, Rhode Island, and we're going to talk about a very horrific crime. We're going to talk about the brutal murder of Jason Foreman. May 18th, 1975 was supposed to be a joyous day in the Foreman household. You had Joyce Foreman who was turning 25 and they were going to have a birthday dinner for her. Outside on that afternoon were the Foreman siblings and one of them being Jason Foreman who was five years old on that date. So he's playing with his siblings and the neighborhood kids outside and he tells everybody he's tired, he's going to go home. And that was the last time anybody seen him. According to Joyce Foreman, who interviewed with the police, she heard her son's voice at around 3.30 p.m. from outside the kitchen window. And that was it. So immediately, she asked her, her daughter, where's your brother Jason? They said he was coming home. Immediately, she calls the police. The police send out all the cars. They get a bunch of volunteers. The sun starts setting, turns into night. The next day, you had about almost 800 volunteers in and around the South Kingstown area looking for this little boy. Days turn into weeks. Unfortunately, weeks turn into months. And months melt into years. This little boy's disappearance reached nationwide media attention. However, it was almost like he disappeared off the face of the earth. And it would remain so until April 15th, 1982. The Foremans had a neighbor that lived across the street from them on 32 Schaefer. Now in the video, you can see I drove by the street where the Foremans used to live. They used to live in that third house when you see the camera pan back. And across the street from that house lived a kid named Michael Woodmansey. Uh, Michael Woodmansey was a uh, described as a very big kid, and he had very few friends, was a loner. I guess you can say the other kids probably thought he was a weirdo. So on that day, Michael Woodmansey was talking to one of the uh, neighborhood kids who was a newspaper delivery boy by the name of Dale Sherman. So he invites him to his home. That's where he lived with his dad. And uh, says, hey, man, you want to drink some alcohol? Uh, the kid's like, yeah, sure, why not, I guess. So he's drinking with him. And all of a sudden, Michael attacks Dale and starts trying to strangle him. As big as this guy was, Dale was fighting for his life and was able to get away from him. And he ran out of the house. Dale goes home to his dad and he tells him, to him hey, the, uh, that Michael Woodmansey kid, uh, he gave me some alcohol and I drank it. I know you're not going to like that I drank it, but I did. But then he tried to strangle me. So immediately his father confronts Michael Woodmansey and asks him if he did that to his son. And before he can react, he punches him right in the face. So Woodmansey's dad sees this and calls the police. The police come and they say, what's going on? And uh, Dale's dad says, I'll tell you what's going on. This freak right here gave my son alcohol and he tried to strangle him. So immediately everybody goes down to the police station to figure out what's going on. And as they're talking and they're seeing what's happening, one of the cops remembers Jason Foreman, the little five-year-old kid that disappeared back in 1975. And... He's looking at this guy and he can just tell us he's a weirdo. So just out of out of thin air, out of just for a hunch, he says, uh, he goes, do you remember the uh, Jason Foreman kid? He said, yeah, yeah, I, re I remember him. And then they start talking. And all of a sudden they start talking about 1975 and where he was at the time. And, and after a couple hours of a conversation, with no proof or no evidence, nothing to say he was involved at all with his disappearance. Woodmansey confesses to kidnap, kidnapping, sexually assaulting him, and killing him. 
And the detective is just looking at Woodman's seat. And Michael says, if you go look at my room, I have his bones and his skull in my drawer. Okay. I don't think a search warrant is needed for this. They go to his house. They go to his room. And in his drawer, like he said, was little Jason Foreman's skull. He has shellacked it and his bones, a protective coating, and kept it in his drawer next to a diary. And in that diary, I can't quote from the diary because the contents of it has been sealed. But basically, I'll say this. Uh, in the diary, it is widely reported that in great detail, he talks about kidnapping Jason, murdering him, sexually assaulting his body, and eating him. He claims in the diary that he ate him. To spare the family the brutal, horrific crime that was committed. Because if they would have took this to trial, the contents of the diary would have been reported and the detectives thought it was in the best interest to spare the family the grief of that. So he just, he just played, he pled guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. This is the grave of Jason Foreman. Now, as you can see, his birth date, and that's the date that he was found, July 15th, 1982. I believe that would be the date that they made a positive ID of the uh, skeletal remains. But he was five years old when he was kidnapped on that day, May 18th, 1975. This is Jason's mom. This is Joyce Ann Foreman. She died of lymphoma when she was 50 years old. I believe that Jason's father is still alive and Jason's father had stated that if he were ever to be released early that he swore that he would kill him that he would find him and he would kill him to take revenge for what he did to his son. Currently I'm on Howard Avenue here in Cranston, Rhode Island and this is the Eleanor Slater Hospital. So why am I here? Well, this is where Michael Woodmansey now resides. Earlier in the video, I told you how he got 40 years in prison. Well, in Rhode Island state law at that time anyways, no matter how heinous or vicious the crime that you committed was, for every month that you do in prison here, they give you 10 days off of your sentence. You do a month, you don't get in any trouble, they knock off 10 days. You keep doing that over and over and over, and then all of a sudden, you turn 40 years into 28 years. And in September 11th, 2011, Michael Woodmansey was released from prison. He made a deal with the court that he would voluntarily check himself into this mental hospital right here. Indefinitely. So as you can see right here, even though this is a state mental hospital, there is barbed wire in the fence. So it doesn't look like a place that is easily, uh, readily to just escape. And according to the voter 
registration online. Yes, I don't know. I guess he is a a registered voter. Uh, his address is here. Now the state hospital, they will they will neither confirm nor deny if he lives here or not. So I have no idea. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and guess and say yes. This is this is where he lives. Okay, guys. Don't know if he'll ever be released. Hopefully he won't. Um, my personal opinion, he should have stayed in prison and rotted like the piece of garbage he is. I don't know if he is allowed to go on field trips or if he's allowed to go to the store. Who knows? This place will not confirm whether he's here or not. I guess uh, patients of this hospital have some kind of rights. So... Hopefully, they keep him until he dies. I believe as of right now, the recording of this video, I believe he is 63 years old. Okay, guys. I'm out at large. I will catch up with you later. Have a good one. Peace out.